I'm assuming that the, the silence is uh, due to anticipation. And certainly I'm looking forward very much to hearing this talk because I don't know very much about Indian and development I want to. Um, our, our guest today is Liz Watson, who some of you may remember came to talk on Etty Hillison in the term before last when we had a series on, on mystics. Uh, so, I, yes, Liz, Liz has got a lot to do with the world community for Christian meditation. And if you want to know what that is, there's lots. I get a daily uh, email from them, which is wonderful. And John May and Lawrence Freeman are the people that you might know already. So, I think I will welcome you and hand over to you, Liz. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Can you... Is this machine doing what it should before we start? Good. <laughs> it's good to check that. Well, it's always... I live in London and it's always great to be in Oxford, so an opportunity to come is lovely. And I might slip into the Ashmolean before I go home, so thank you for <laughs> inviting me. So, when we're talking about... The title I've given to this talk is Evelyn Underhill, The Making of a Mystic because that's really what she's interested in. How people became mystics and how we might follow their footsteps. So at the heart of any sort of um, pursuit of the divine or an attempt to engage with the reality of God is silence. So let's start with a few minutes of silence. You may be have your own practices of silence, but let me just help you a little into the stillness in a very simple way. So just put anything down that's in your hand. It's a sort of dispossession in itself. You're not grasping anything, holding on to anything. And when you're not holding on to anything outwardly, you can begin to let go of things physically, mentally, and deep within yourself. So first of all, just give your attention to your body. Attention is really the heart of silence and the heart of prayer. You're not analyzing yourself, you're just noticing what's there. You're noticing at this moment that you're, you have a body, you are bodily. So maybe you could have a sense of the whole of the upper part of your body from the crown of your head, drop down into the seat of the pew, so that you can really come to rest on the pew. You don't need to be holding anything in your upper body up at this moment. You can settle in your body. Feel the weight of your thighs on the pew, all those heavy muscles settle. And your lower legs just drop down from your knees. And enjoy feeling, I hope, a little more relaxed. A little stiller, a little less busy, distracted. And for many people what helps to still us even more is to become aware of the breath. Again, you're not judging it or analyzing it, you're simply becoming aware of what's happening in you all the time. Breath flowing in and the breath flowing out. Breath flowing in, breath flowing out. Just give it your simple attention. that 
simple giving of attention to the breath does in fact smooth the breath out. You're not trying to make anything happen. And so you can rest for a moment or two in the stillness. The stillness within you. If you're going to stay there for a long time, you'll need a bit more help. Let's just rest there for a short time longer. Good, so let's come back again and think about uh, Evelyn Underhill. For those of you to whom she's new, I'll start off with some dates so that you can locate her historically. She lived from 1875 to 1941. 1875 to 1941. And she's a she. <laughs> You can't tell that from the name Evelyn necessarily, can you? <laughs> so let's establish those two things first of all. And the book I want to focus on is the book by which she's most well known, although she wrote a lot, which is called Mysticism. It was published in 1911 when she was 36 and remained in, remained in publication and went through many editions uh, for, for the whole of her life. After she died, her writing was somewhat eclipsed, but in the last 20 years or so, people are digging her out again and seeing what she has to say. I was, this book had a huge impact. It, it went to the top of the bestseller list straight away and stayed there. You know, which seems a bit odd in a way, it's just a book called Mysticism. I was trying to think if there was a, a comparison we could, could make with a book in our own time that was similar. And the one that came to mind was Thomas Merton's book, Seven Story Mountain, which somehow hit the public popular consciousness in a big way, even though he was talking about very profound things. So I think this book was something like that. It wasn't the only book that had been written about mysticism. There was certainly a flowering of some of the deeper ways of uh, living into God and living out of God. There had been, just before Evelyn Underhill's book, a book by Dean Inge on mysticism and one by the Roman Catholic um, theologian, lay theologian, Baron von Hugel, and also William James' study Varieties of religious experience had been published not that long before. So it wasn't that it was the only book on the subject, it was just that the way she presented it somehow struck home in a particular way for the people of her time. She was, of course, unusual writing as a woman on those sorts of topics in her time. So in many ways she was breaking through uh, in a pioneering way. Donald Alchin, um, canon of the Church of England, who you may know, recounts a lovely memory of her when she went to a meeting of the Fellowship of St. Alban and St. Sergius that brings together the Anglican and Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, when a noted Russian theologian, Father Sergei Bulgakov, at the end of the meeting asked the secretary, whoever is that little woman? She knows far too much. <laughs> Which says a lot, doesn't it? Partly about the standing of women uh, in theological and, ch and church circles. But, and also about the impact she made in that august uh, gathering. Whoever is that little woman, she knows far too much. And it's, it almost says something quite important about her. 
She was, in many ways, a, a very ordinary woman. Yet, in other ways, she was an extraordinary woman. And that was really what she was about. It's what her work, her writing, her teaching and retreat leading, which I'll say more about, were about. That ordinary people have the capacity for the extraordinary. That this capacity to open to the depths of God, to our own depths and the depths of the God, was for anybody who was called to it, not for people who are um, specialists or uh, particularly theologically educated or in monasteries, that we all have this capacity and dint of being children of God. And that was her passion. Her passion was to get this over. Something of what this little series is about, really, is opening up the same sort of thing that she was interested in, passionate about. So, ordinary. She was actually born in Wolverhampton. Her family moved to London. She lived all of her life in Kensington. Um, she never moved. She was born there. She um, was educated at home and then in Folkestone. And then she went to the new ladies' department at King's and New. So this is my sense of a woman coming out. The new ladies' department at King's College London. <laughs> Things have changed in a short period of time, really, where she studied history, botany, art, and languages. So she had a, a good education and was loved education and being educated. Her mother, her father was a barrister. Her mother was at home raising family, doing good works. Almost a typical Edwardian upbringing. They took trips to the continent, she and her mother, so she was introduced, to, she was particularly in love with Italy, and I know that's where Georgie has just come back from, so she'll relate to that. And the marvellous art, uh, and the aesthetics really, of Italy. Um, and then when she was 32, she married her childhood friend who lived around the corner, and they set up house very much in the same area in, uh, in Kensington, so she didn't move very far. And that's where she lived for the vast majority of her life. So, typical Edwardian, upper middle class home, a couple of servants, a lot of, a lot of entertaining. Um, she had her own study, a place where she could do bookbinding, her husband was a, also a lawyer, Lincoln's Inn. Um, he loved sailing. He was very practical. He loved fixing things. If DIY had been invented then, I'm sure he would have been <laughs> around at B&Q regularly. <laughs> a very practical uh, sort of man. And that was, in a sense, the ordinariness of her life. But her extraordinariness comes out in some of the tributes made of her, her friend T.S. Eliot said, her studies have the inspiration not primarily of the scholar or the champion of forgotten genius, but of the consciousness of the grievous need of the contemplative element in the modern world. So she was rooted in scholarship, but what she was doing was something else. She was trying to inspire really, her contemporaries. Michael Ramsey, um, Archbishop of Canterbury, said that he thought that she'd done more than anyone else to keep the life of prayer alive in the Anglican Church in the period between the wars, which is a big claim to make. And the reason he says that is because that uh, uh, she was a writer, a beautiful writer. She wrote 39 books, produced more than 350 articles in theological journals and spiritual journals. She was very adept at languages. She made a lot of translations of some of the European mystics. She published a great number of book reviews. She did broadcasts. She later in life became a retreat leader and spiritual director. So that was, those are the ways in which her influence was, was felt in the Anglican Church. She was the first one to be invited to give a lecture series in theology at Oxford University here. She was elected a Fellow of King's College and awarded an honorary Doctor of Divinity at University of Aberdeen. So that's what you need to set against her, her quite genteel 
sophisticated home life in Kensington. And two things come together in her. Her character seems to me to have been um, highly energetic. She seemed to do things at speed. She says that herself. She's used to doing things at speed. <laughs> so she's, uh, her intellect is quick. She's not superficial, but highly energetic, and in some ways, in some areas of her life, uh, quite passionate, and in others, uh, not so. So that's a little bit to give you a sense of, of who she is. How did she um, arrive at writing this book? Her religious background was a school background. She was confirmed at school, but she said she left school really pretty agnostic, dazed at the most. <laughs> um, so it hadn't really grasped her. She didn't have any fire in her about it at that early stage. There was nothing that really connected in any deep way. So it certainly didn't arise there. Her parents were not particularly religious, so she didn't get it from there either. What did strike her, and why she did find some inner stirrings, were through art and beauty. So if she had a sense of God, she wouldn't have called it God then. It would be, in particular, through beauty, art, music. And her travels in Italy with her mother were very important. And I think must have started a stirring in her, which, she, which was strong enough for her to need to keep following. She read some philosophy, so she was very struck in particular by the Neoplatonist philosophy of Plotinus, and his sense of, the, of, of this search for the one that, that must take you, it must be more important in your life than anything else. So she was struck by that. Called. And then when she was in Italy, she um, had a, a sort of conversion moment in a Roman Catholic church. And she says that although this conversion moment is very hard to describe, although this um, strong sense of God came to her in this setting, and she recognized that it was very much tied up with the richness of the symbolism, the architecture and the art in this um, Italian Catholic church. She said that the, the content wasn't particularly Christian, but it was certainly divine. <laughs> and so she really felt that um, the Catholic church should be her home. <laughs> but it didn't become her home. <laughs> And there are two reasons in particular why it didn't. One was because she was a modernist in her thinking and in her, in her, in her philosophy. And at that time, the Roman Catholic Church was extremely anti-modernism. And indeed, the, the Pope around that time had written encyclical anti-modernism. So she wasn't at all sure whether she could commit herself to a church which rejected a lot of what was extremely important to her. The other difficulty, which was a particular stumbling block for her, was that her husband, who was a mm, fairly agnostic sort of <laughs> middle class, vaguely church attending <laughs> Christian, there was a great deal of divisiveness between the Anglican and Roman Catholic Church in that period, and a great deal of suspicion and ignorance, of course. That's where suspicion comes from largely. Um, and her husband was to be was absolutely terrified, really, that she would go to the confession, confessional, and spill out her private life to the priest, and that would include their relationship. And he couldn't see how they could sustain an intimate relationship if part of what was intimate was um, not bounded by their own relationship, but could be spilled out beyond it. So those are the two of the reasons why she decides not to, to go there. She, she has got magic, <laughs> a lot of the occult around at that time, so 
yeah, she joins um, Magic Circle, I suppose you could call it, um, called the Golden Dawn, associated with a man called Elifas Levi and someone else whose name escapes me at this precise moment. I might have it here. Um, Arthur Waite. As the names may or not mean anything to you. We'll come back to that briefly. So, so she's continuing to find this way to this noumenal world beyond the phenomena that we're bound to otherwise. But, she, but that, that didn't work for her. It, it just didn't really go where she wanted to go. It didn't plunge the depths that, that she was seeking to, um, to have plunged in a way in her. And again, I'll come back to that. So uh, when she uh, dissociates herself from that, then eventually she ends up in the Anglican Church, and that's where she stays. But we're not surprised to know that really it was the Tractarian movement and the Anglo-Catholic side of the, of the Anglican Church that she's particularly drawn to and hopes to draw other people to as well. That would be very much in keeping with her conversion experience in the Italian Catholic Church. So, she at one point says that she lived in a way on the borderland of things. She couldn't join the church that she felt most committed to. <laughs> um, and her position in the Anglican Church, she wasn't ordained. She didn't have any official positions in the church. She was a laywoman. So she always had this, this sense of being on the edge and being on the border. And I think in herself, it says something about where she is in herself, her ability um, to commit herself in her entirety to things. And actually she says she loves being on the border. In a letter in 1932 she wrote this. It, it's one of the advantages of being a scamp, <laughs> that one is unable to crystallize into the into the official shape, and so retains touch with other freelancers, and realizes how awful the ecclesiastical attitude and atmosphere often makes them feel. So she's, in her view, there are definite advantages to, to not being too embedded into the, the official uh, side of things, where you're required somehow to take on the right shape for the institution. That's her view. So she's very happy being where she is. So what she undertakes is this very broad um, survey of the Christian mystical tradition, largely Christian, not entirely. She does spill over into Islam, she, she's a, a little bit of familiarity with Buddhism, but uh, largely the Christian mystical tradition. The scope of it is quite extraordinary. Uh, this book is absolutely peppered with quotes from a very wide range of mystics indeed. And at that time, a lot of the texts were not readily available as they are becoming available now. So she must have done a great deal of research and a good deal of translation to do that. So a very keen scholar and student. The subtitle of the book is A Study of the Nature and Development of Man's Spiritual Consciousness, which gives you, in itself, a clue to her approach to it. A Study of the Nature and Development of Man's Spiritual Consciousness. So she's not interested in doing a historical survey. She's wanting to say, look, we all have a spiritual consciousness and it can be awoken. And here's the testimony of many people who've gone before you and this is what it looks like or this is how I see it. So, in the first part, she is really trying to clear the ground. She's trying to say, well, what is mysticism? She calls it the mystic fact. What do we mean? when we talk about mysticism. So she starts off uh, with attempting a definition. Starts off actually by saying what it's not. She says one of the, 
Mysticism is one of the most abused words in the English language. It has been used in different and often mutually exclusive senses by religion, poetry, and philosophy. Philosophy. So everyone wants to just label their particular thing with it. Says. <laughs> it's been claimed as an excuse for every kind of occultism, which of course you knew about, for dilute transcendentalism, vapid symbolism, religious or aesthetic sentimentality, and bad metaphysics. <laughs> She's a good writer, isn't she? <laughs> On the other hand, it has been freely employed as a term of contempt by those who have criticised these things. It is much to be hoped that it may be restored sooner or later to its old meaning as the science or art of the spiritual life. So that's her definition, one of them anyway. The science or art of the spiritual life. Broadly speaking, I understand it to be the expression of the innate tendency of the human spirit towards complete harmony with the transcendental order. The expression of the innate tendency, what's in us already, towards complete harmony with the transcendental order of God. Mysticism is the art of union with reality. The mystic is a person who has attained that union in greater or lesser degree, or who aims at and believes in such attainment. He can make direct contact with the reality of God, which is the ultimate reality. And in her view, it, it's, it's an, that there's an organic process involved. Something has to happen in us. Change has to happen in us. An organic process which involves the perfect consummation of the love of God. So, clearing the ground for what we're going to be examining in some detail. And then she goes on to say what it can be confused with, but isn't. And the basic distinction that she's making as she examines various things that we can confuse it with are knowing the difference between knowing in a sense of knowing about, knowing things about, and between being who I am, how I live, rather than what I know about. And sometimes the distinction is between knowing about and loving. So loving and being are very intimately connected in her thought. So you can't make this journey, you can't enter into this process of transformation simply by reading about it. So she says philosophy can't take us there. Thinking about it isn't enough. It's not an, mysticism is not an idea, an opinion, a point of view, or the pursuit of knowledge in an intellectual sense. It's a lived process of transformation. I'll quote you something she says about um, one of the current philosophies in her time, idealism, because I think she puts it very well and gives you a sense of how she writes, which I think is a delight. Even idealism, perhaps the most sublime theory of being which has ever been constructed by the human intellect, is stultified by the exclusive intellectualism of its own methods, by its fatal trust in the squirrel work of the industrious brain instead of the piercing vision of the desirous heart. There's that key distinction coming up. Trusting in the squirrel work of the industrious brain instead of the piercing vision of the desirous heart, the desire for God, the desire of the whole being for God. When we ask the idealist how we are to attain communion with the reality he describes to us as certainly there, his system suddenly breaks down and discloses itself as a diagram of the heavens 
not a ladder up to the stars. It doesn't tell you how to get describes it beautifully, but doesn't tell you how to get there. It interests man, but does not involve him in its process, so it's detached. Does not catch him up to the new and more real life which it describes. Hence the thing that matters, the living thing, has somehow escaped it. And its observations bear the same relation to reality as the art of the anatomist does to the mystery of birth. So anatomists can describe what happens when you give birth, but unless you've given birth, you really don't know what it is. <laughs> A nice image there, I think. So do you get the sense of what she's trying to drive through with? It's to do with the desire of the heart and what we can live. Describing it helps because it inspires us, but we have to find a way to touch that reality ourselves, within ourselves and for ourselves in a way that changes us. She says there's something very similar about theology and ritual. It points us to where we need to go, but we still have to go there. She says something similar about science. Science fails us because it's unable to take into account major tracks of human consciousness, in particular groups of perceptions and experiences connected with the religion, pain and beauty. It can tell us how all sorts of things work, she says, but it cannot tell us how religion, pain and beauty work or how to get there. Magic, she says, doesn't deliver the goods either. And this is what she says about it. She regards it as a false mysticism because it appears to take you where you want to go, to where the longings of the heart are satisfied, but it doesn't quite do it. And I think we can think of in our own time uh, all sorts of false or not very deep spiritualities which are <coughs> easy to be fooled by if we have difficulty with the idea of magic. <coughs> says it presents magic as a pathway to reality, a promise which it cannot fulfill. For the mere transcending of phenomena does not entail the attainment of the absolute. So just to deny that your senses can tell you, or your reason can tell you everything you need to know, doesn't necessarily lead you to God. And that's very true in our own time, isn't it? People who no longer understand what religious language is pointing to and ditch it, it'll either take you deeper into God or it'll leave you in a sort of nihilism where there is nothing. So she says, we are likely to fall victims to some kind of magic the moment that the direct declaration, I want to know, as the declaration, I want to be from the chief place in our consciousness that distinction again. What drives us on the mystical path is that I want to be. I want to be who I really am or who I'm meant to be or, or who I could be in God. That sort of sense. That's what it's about. It's a personal transformation that has to be at the heart of what's growing in us. She also talks about art, inevitably, because that's been a source of great inspiration to her and she feels that her spirit has been deeply touched by it, which is the experience of many people. And she says, there is certainly some art where the artist, not merely by technique, not merely being, by dint of being a very good artist, a very good painter, a very good sculptor, a very good musician, has clearly touched into something else. And we touch into it when we really look or really hear. 
but it's usually transient. We know we've touched something, but it doesn't usually begin to have a lasting effect on us. She has quite a lot to say about that, but I think that's probably enough to give you a sense. So, she's doing a lot of clearing of the ground and trying to get you to the point where you've stripped away some of the illusion and are ready to, to hear the real meat of it all. So, she comes up with uh, four marks of mysticism, four features that are indispensable in her view. So she says, true mysticism is active and practical, not passive or theoretical. That something that transforms the way we are, the way we live. We have to do something. We have to do some prayer. We have to do some adoration. We have to do some, rec some uh, contemplation. Then it begins to change us. It's an organic life process, a something which the whole self does, not something as to which it's in, not something as to which it's in. No, that doesn't make sense. We'll forget that sentence. <laughs> I must have mistyped it and have forgotten what it was meant to say. <laughs> it's a lived process engaging all aspects of the person not just a concept to which the intellect has assented. By the time we get to 20 past one, well, I'm sure you would have got that, because <laughs> she keeps on saying it again and again, it's so important to her. Its aims are wholly transcendental, this is the second mark, and spiritual. It's no way concerned with adding to, exploring, rearranging, or improving anything in the visible universe. So it's not to do primarily with adding something on, adding some religion on. It's not to do with primarily with reorganizing society. It's not primarily concerned with making conditions better for the poor. And I say primarily, <laughs> deliberately. It's to do with this inner work, it's reaching out to what is beyond us. <coughs> The third mark, they're very much aligned with each other. Um, the one, she often calls it the one, the God, the real, the transcendent. It's not merely the reality of all that is, but also a living and personal object of love. Never an object of exploration. So again, back to this theme of love, which is what unites us with anything, and certainly with God. It draws his whole being homeward, always under the guidance of the heart, with a sense of being drawn by love back home, back home into the heart of God and into ourselves. And she says, living union with this one, with God, is a definite state or form of enhanced life. So again, the same theme coming through, that it transforms your life. Now, we're going to come on to your handout now. So you want to follow through on this one. It's a good moment. So let's start with that quote on the um, head of the mystic way. Transcendental matters are, for most of us, always beyond the margin. Because most of us have given up our whole consciousness to the occupation of the senses and permitted them to construct a universe in which we are contented to remain. Only in certain states, recollection, contemplation, ecstasy and their allied conditions, does the self contrive to turn out the usual tenets shut the gateways of the flesh and let those submerged powers 
which are capable of picking up messages from another player, the plane of view, have their turn. So usually we're so occupied with our everyday life and what's coming at us that we really don't have an opportunity to tune in to these deeper longings that are implanted within us that can't be accessed by our outward senses and our thinking mind. Messages from another plane of being. <clears throat> then it is the sense world which retreats beyond the margin and another landscape that rushes in. God is sort of dying to rush in there if we make some space. At last then we begin to see something of what contemplation does for its initiates. The putting to sleep, the last sentence, the putting to sleep of that normal self which usually wakes and the awakening of that transcendental self which usually sleeps. It's a bit of a statement summary of what it's about for her. And she says, if you begin to feel, you begin to be drawn into this search, search for God, search for truth, you tend to have different language for it. And she says it's universal. It's a universal search. Then what she does in uh, the rest of the book, actually, in the second half of the book, is she defines five stages in this process of the transformation of consciousness, um, which I've written down there to okay. uh, have a look at. And then she looks at each one of them in more detail with marvelous examples from masses of mystics. <laughs> Fascinating. In doing this, she does something which is in a way quite impossible and she knows it. She's trying to set out a schema of what a mystical path looks like as the human being treads it. A, she says it, it doesn't go from stage one to stage two to stage three to stage four to stage five. It just isn't the way it is. Um, we sort of meander around between them. And also, as she says, it's the divine works in each soul so individually that it's very difficult to put it all into a neat schema, to put it into a box. And um, she says some of the things that, that, that she describes of these five marks, some, some people just miss out some of them altogether. Um, some are more enhanced in, in some mystics than others. So she really gives a bit of a health warning before she does this. <laughs> but still she gives it a shot. Because <laughs> she wants to find some way of putting across that, that something has to happen in us when um, we begin to get close to the living God. So this is the way she puts it. I hope it's not too dry without masses of examples from the mystics, but we'll give it a start. So the first stage, she says, and this is your handout, is the awakening of the self to consciousness of divine reality. This is usually a conversion experience or a mystical experience. So, you know, one of the obvious ones, a uh, biblical one, the last one, lots of them in the Bible, the author Jesus himself. Um, but Paul, conversion on the road to Damascus, is probably one of the ones that comes to mind most readily. <laughs> a point where God, Christ, just breaks through, stops him in his tracks, it blinds him, inwardly and in the story, outwardly. And he's you're just out of it for a while. And then you know, angels in the form of people who've also had dreams and visions come and help him. And his life completely changes course. He disappears off the scene for three years to somehow absorb what's happened, I think. And then we know the rest of the story. So maybe you have your own example of that point in work when your life when something broke through. It's very common. 
very common indeed. Sometimes people forget them until much later in life when they come back. They often experience love, joy, oneness, um, peace, all sorts of things, where another reality seems to come to the fore. Always by surprise and out of the blue. A breakthrough, awakening to the consciousness of divine reality. If it's forgotten, well, it's forgotten, but in some souls, she says, and she says there are certain sorts of personalities who are, who are drawn to this deeper search. If it's not forgotten, if it really impinges and begins to take root, then the desire for what's been opened up begins to grow. And um, a person begins <coughs> gradually to see that this reality exists and that this is the thing, and increasingly the only thing, that will make life really worth living. So that desire has been opened up and the desire to pursue it gets gradually stronger and stronger. And if that happens, she says, then the self aware for the first time of divine beauty, that's what she calls it at this point, she has many, she picks up many names for it during the book, realizes by contrast its own finiteness and imperfection. The manifold illusions in which it is immersed, the immense distance which separates it from the one. It attempts to eliminate by discipline and mortification all that stands in the way of its progress towards union with God constitute purgation, a state of pain and effort. It's really off putting, isn't it? <laughs> I still think I don't want to go there. <laughs> so, what tends to happen is self knowledge begins to grow, and you realise that not only are you a child of God, but you're actually a bit of a mess as well. And there's some things that certainly have to be sorted out in your life. And the motivation uh, to sort them out begins to get higher because this sense of a goal, this sense of something bigger is bubbling up in you. We need a bit of a clean-up job inside. It's really what it's about. But it can be very painful. She's very right about that. The pain of self-knowledge and the things that bring us to self-knowledge Sometimes illness and deep distress. Sometimes it's deep distress and illness that awaken us to the divine reality to start with. But fortunately, that, that period of being cleaned up are always interspersed with times of what she calls illumination. When we see God, is that the sun's come out. We've been for a really tough time. And then the sun comes out. And we feel liberation, we feel peace, we feel love, more love for others, and we, we have a sense that our life has changed. And maybe a little sense that our life changing means that our relationships with others are changing as well, that we have a bit more to give. So although she calls these stage two and stage three, they, they, they're always interspersed with each other. There's a tough time and then a time I've never had a child, but I sometimes think a childbirth must be like that. It's almost like death, some women say, but then they go and have another one. <laughs> because the delight of the child is so great <laughs> that you forget the pain that you've gone through because what's come in its way is so beautiful um, and so desirable. She says it's a state of happiness, a sense of divine presence. You feel God is with you, in you begin to see God everywhere else too. And then she says in stage four, um, the final and complete purification of the self, which is called by some contemplatives the mystic pain, the mystic death, purification of the spirit or the dark night of the soul, that's St. John of the Cross, a very well known uh, praise, where quite often people feel that God has deserted them. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because so there's a, a much more radical 
disassociating from um, the ego, we would say in our modern parlance, in order to come into even more closer relationship with the divine. We have to let go of our own will, of anything that we want, in order for God to be all in all to us, and then in the end, um, the possibility of a union. You could read that you know, your, yourself in more detail if you want to. Um, but just to wrap it up so there's a bit of time for questions. So as I said in the rest of the, the book, um, she puts a lot of flesh on that rather dry listing of stages of the mystic way. And in a way, once she's written that book, She devotes the rest of her life to finding ways to say it to people, to say it to ordinary people. As I said, through writing articles, more books, she becomes a very well-known retreat leader. She's particularly associated with the retreat house in Essex, Pleshy, that some of you may know. She gave a lot of her retreats at Pleshy, not only there. as a spiritual director. <clears throat> but as her writing develops, I think what begins to appear in it is, is a, a more grounded understanding of what's going on. Um, I think the figure of Christ and the Incarnation becomes gradually more important to her the sense that the body is involved in it. And a heightened sense of what's there already, that this journey towards union with God it is not sort of something up in the sky, which is rather remote, which it can sound like. But it's really, as all the Christian mystics say, what happens is that you are propelled back into the world to live in a new way, to live in a more loving way, so this initial detachment from all the satisfactions of the world that enable you to meet more closely with God propel you back into the world with less ego. We tend to use that language in our own time because of the psychological way in which we tend to think. With less in the way of the, of the possibility of serving and loving. Of wanting to give ourselves to others in love and service in whatever ways of love and service we're being called to. So, so it's a clarifying, I think, of, the, of our personhood so that we see more clearly. And because we see more clearly, we know what we should do. And because we have lost a great deal of our own fear, we are able to give ourselves more fearlessly to what we feel drawn to. And that's almost a test of what's going on. She talks about ecstasy and rapture and visions, which are not at all uncommon, but not given to everybody. But she's very wise in saying that they have to be tested. It means nothing to have a mystical experience in itself. The only test of whether it begins to make a difference to the way you can live. If it doesn't, it's, it's like puff smoke. It's gone. So these experiences or phenomena in themselves are not important. It's how it's helping us to tread this path more faithfully to God and thence into service of the world that are the keys to it. Um, so she also begins to talk more about the spiritual life rather than about mysticism, which I guess is a way she finds more accessible for other people. And to begin to teach people prayer, which is the heart of it. Ways of prayer, ways of prayer that are right for them, um, and to try and lead them along the path. Right, let's stop there. You've got all the five minutes left for questions and comments. Thank you, Liz. I'm so delighted we came around to that at the end. Just as I was thinking we were going off into a, a bit of a reverie of self-inwardness. Um, 
Yeah, very important.